The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Uh, thank you very much, Kay. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Ekenel, and I work, for, I work with ICC Evaluation Service. And I'll be talking one of the projects I was involved. And as Kay mentioned, you won't see this uh, title in your booklet because I am the last minute replacement. So I tried to put together something real quick. And I want to talk about this ultra high performance concrete tin wall cladding panels and we, how we show building code compliance. This was one of the projects I was involved. I wasn't the primary engineer, but now I inherited this, uh, pr <laughs> this project. And first I want to, uh, when we request, when we received a request from one of the uh, manufacturer and they want to show building on compliance of their material, we said, can you define it to us? So I want to define what the material is first, and then I want to talk about the building code compliance concept, and then I want to show how, how we complete the building code compliance process. So when the producer approached to us, we asked some questions, can you please define your material to us? And the producer said it's a factory uh, fabricated ultra high performance tin wall cladding panels. They are mechanically attached to the wall framing with post installed anchors, and then they are for exterior use only. There is no conventional steel reinforcement, and they said their maximum thickness is one inch. And then what made this complicated? They are using ultra high performance concrete. This project started in 2014, and we came up with this. Uh, Brief description, I know 239 is working on a, on a broader description. We said ultra high performance concrete is a cementitious composite material composed of cement, fine aggregate, super plasticizer, accelerator, synthetic fibers, and other mixtures. I want to note that this is a project for a specific proprietary mix. So they were using synthetic fibers and they were using some other admixtures and accelerators. So I want to talk about, okay, we said we know your material, so we can help you because some code officials, design engineers, when they see the ultra high performance concrete, they're kind of skeptical to use it because building codes may or may not have it. And I want to talk about the building codes. You know, when I say building codes, I mean the international building code, which is now adopted by all 50 states in the United States. And it's the predominant building code in the United States. And when states adopt this building code, they change the name. So international building code becomes California building code in California. Or in Florida, it becomes Florida international building code. But it, they all based on one single model building code throughout the United States, which is international building code. And international building code refers to other code documents, and they become code book by reference. That's the terminology we use. We say code book by reference. There are three ACI books are in the list: ACI 318, ACI 530, or you may know it as TMS 402, and the third one is A ACI 216, fire resistance. And they are all become code book by reference. And when we look at this material, none of these code books they address the system, especially ultra high performance concrete. But the good thing about the building code, there is the section 104.11. You know, he says, hey, if you have a code alternative material and you can show at least the equivalent of the underlined right here, at least the equivalent of that prescribed in this code in quality, strength, effectiveness, fire resistance durability and safety. If you can demonstrate that this is equivalent to the build, what's in the building code, you can use it. And it says, if necessary, research reports may help from approved sources. And who are, who use research reports? Some design engineers usually use uh, research reports. Code officials, uh, building inspectors, they use research reports. So that's, this is the part that my jobs get really interesting. How do I write research report for a cold alternative material? Well, first, I need to develop an acceptance criteria through an open public process. And it happens three times a year. It's open to public, and it's live broadcast through web, so everybody in the world can see it. Actually, when I look at who is watching these uh, discussions, I see people from all around the world, from China to Middle East to South America. And then, so we developed this acceptance criteria, AC458, through a public process, and there's an independent committee, there are nine code officials, they're independent jury members, they listen public, they listen us, they listen the manufacturer, and they decide whether this acceptance criteria can be approved or not. So we developed AC458, 
And we, our goal is that section 104.11, I saw three slides before. We want to show building code compliance in strength, durability, fire safety, environmental sensitivities, and structural design. So if I go into details, obviously I don't have time to talk entire criteria. Maybe I can highlight the requirements of this criteria for ultra high performance concrete wall cladding materials. One of the requirements was prescriptive. We didn't want to deal, we still said, okay, weather resistance consideration per code, you have to comply with the code. So if there's a weather barrier is required by the code official, go ahead and put that weather, uh, weather envelope in the building. And then we have material test in this, uh, in this acceptance criteria. For compression strength, we refer to ASDMC 39. And for structural strength, we refer to ASDMC 1609. And because the conventional reinforcement rebar is absent from the ultra high performance content panels, we, uh, with the discussions with the public and the industry and the, and the producers, we require that the, the ASDM 1609 testing be observed and similar to what's shown in the, in the figure. And we require that the post cracking peak strength shall be greater than the first peak strength. And of course, this is a proprietary ultra high performance concrete mix, and it has synthetic fibers, and we wanted to make test those synthetic fibers. And sometimes the criteria crisscross each other. We have a different criteria, which is AC32 for synthetic fibers, and we require the synthetic fibers used in this ultra high performance concrete tested and comply with section 4.6 for, uh, for fiber compatibility with concrete. And also material test requires water absorption test for ASDM C642. And after discussion with public and the industry and the court officials, we acceptance condition uh, set as less than 9%. Also the criteria requires some durability test on this uh, material. It has free staff testing. And again, after discussions with the industry, we decided that uh, durability factor of 90, it may sound higher, but this ultra high performance concrete, we require durability factor of 90 after 300 cycles. It requires alkali silica reactivity or fine aggregate. And again, after discussions during the open public hearing process, we set the value as less than 0.1%. And criteria requires linear coefficient of thermal expansion per ASDM C531. And we require that the average values posted in the research report written for this proprietary uh, mix material. Uh, now, this is interesting. During the public discussion and, and in, in discussions with the industry, we wanted to uh, see the effect of weather, uh, you know, temperature cycling on these panels when they are, because they are exterior use, always exterior use. And we couldn't find an ASTM or document to address this issue. So we came up with, uh, with, a, with a test procedure. And after long discussions, actually, this went to public hearing three times because it looks perfect on the paper, but when the laboratories start testing, you know, they figure out some deficiencies, so it, it was revised three times. I couldn't put every single detail on this slide, obviously, but it requires 25 consecutive temperature cycles on five full-scale panels made out of ultra-high performance concrete, and they should be a maximum panel size, and they should be attached as they are attached in the real-life conditions and they are cycled in an environmental chamber, and each cycle consists of five steps, one hour of water exposure at room temperature, followed by six hours at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by two hours at 40, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by 14 hours at 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and followed by one hour of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is one cycle, and we require 25 consecutive cycles on these panels, and what we look is the, you know, how it affects the performance of the panels, and after exposure there shall be no cracking, checking, phrasing, erosion, or other characteristics that might affect the performance, I think that's the key word, that might affect the performance on if there is wall cladding. Additionally, there shall be no sign of failure or distress at faster locations. Again, please note that this is a prescriptive, uh, this is a, prim, prim, uh, this is a this is a material that's produced by a specific manufacturer, so they use anchors, so we want to make sure that the anchors also don't fail. Again, I'm showing building code compliance of an alternative materials. When I say build, building code compliance, I have to address from A to Z. That's what the code officials require. That's why building code officials require. That's why the design engineers would like to see. So building code recovers from durability strength to uh, fire resistance to flame propagation to non-combustibility. So if you are using this material as a part of the fire resistance rating system, you have to test this material. You know, we are, 
and otherwise you will be limited to non-fire resin rating. And the codes require flame propagation if you want to be used in type uh, one, two, three, four construction, and if you are over 140 feet in height, and, and if you have a combustible water resistant barrier. If you remember in one of my previous slides, I said you have to comply with the code for the water resistant barrier, and if you have that combustible barrier, you have to test per NFPA uh, 285, and code requires non-combustibility testing. If you don't do it, you'll be limited to type five construction, which has very limited application area. And the acceptance criteria also refers to thermal resistance per ASDMC 518. Although it's not really a code requirement, IBC doesn't really go into thermal resistance at the moment, but uh, it's kind of an optional test. If you do it, we publish it. So, you know, I'm trying to show building code compliance. I tested material, I checked the durability, I looked at fire resistance, flame spread, and other stuff. Now, when it comes to structural, we discuss with the applicant and the public how, what can we, how can we address the structural performance. I'm writing a research report for this proprietary material, and we decided that maybe we can go a level stress design and publish the wind pressures, a level wind pressures, and we de determined the safety factor was three and it requires testing for ASTM E330, and we define the ultimate strength as the strength before the first crack of the panels. Now this is again a proprietary wall panel made out of ultra high performance concrete, and they are attached to the substrate using concrete anchors. So we need to address, we thought addressing anchors would be, it should be needed, and then we, uh, again, we crisscross acceptance criteria. We refer to AC193, which is acceptance criteria for mechanical anchors in concrete elements. And then we re require that tension test for leeward wind and shear test required for in these ankle panels. And we want to make sure that this is the most conservative case. We looked at the codes and criteria. And we determined that maybe we do this test at a, a cracked concrete, assuming this is the worst case scenario, the concrete cracked and the anchor is there and the wind is blowing. So we de decided to do the testing at 0.08 inch crack width. And then, and this is where the design engineer or structural engineer takes part. And they determine, we determine the wind pressure and then they assign the tributary wind loads to the anchors and make sure that the anchors uh, allowable loads are higher so the anchor failure is prevented. Again, the ultimate goal is writing a research report to help code officials, building officials, or uh, design engineers to use this material until you know, codes are written or guidelines are developed in the industry. So we put some limitations for this material. For example, one of them, again, we want uh, structural engineers directly involvement, and we want a research report to state that the design professional shall consider stiffness compatibility of the substrate wall systems with the thin cladding panels and not introduce any additional stresses to the panels. We want the structure engineer to make sure that there, there is stiffness compatibility. And then at the moment, this criteria is still developing and improving. At the moment, we don't have much information or test procedures for, to address high seismic design categories. So we limit the use of these ultra high performance con concrete panels to seismic design categories A and B only. And then, as I mentioned, we went to a level stress design procedure and we, we decided to publish uh, wind pressure loads for the panels. Again, if you look at that section 104.11 of the International Building Code, which is the predominant building code all around the United States, it requires you know, strength, durability, fire resistance. It also requires quality control. I'm writing a research report specific for a material. I want to make sure that they use the same or better anchors or same or better mixtures so they don't, their allowable loads we published are not adversely affected. So we inspect them twice a year. And we inspect the concrete mix, we inspect their, what kind of fibers they are using, we inspect the panels, placement, and form uh, dimensions and anchors. And so we make sure that they are produced per quality control manual. And again, we are helping building officials in the, in the field and, and when you open up the building codes, there is not much information about inspection of the ultra high performance concrete panels. Again, we decide, try to help the code officials and build, or design engineers or inspectors by ad addressing this issue in the, in the research report. And the research report after public discussions and input from the code officials requires periodic inspections, periodic special inspections, and the inspection requirements are detailed in the report and they shall include inspection of anchors, and the post, uh, in the hardened concrete members and erection of the precast concrete members. So the special inspection will be inspected periodically in the job site. So 
in summary, you know, IBC, as known, it's a predominant building code in the United States, all states, 50 states, all departments, uh, state departments, even the territories, USA territories, adopted as a model building code, as their legal building code. And section 104.11 allows alternative materials. And in many cases, code officials, design engineers require a research report to be able to use it until the guidelines or the codes uh, become available. And then, so we developed AC 458 to address this issue, you know, is an interim solution. And the resulting research report issued in accordance with AC 458 demonstrate the code compliance and is primarily used by code officials and structural or design engineers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ram. I mean, let me start with one. What kind of size of pants are we talking about? Just to show a picture. The thickness you mentioned, maximum one inch, but then in terms of what size? Uh, I, I, as far as I remember, we def didn't define the size, but we require tests to be done on, on the full size. So we should be recognizing them as the maximum size. Whatever they test should be the prescriptive in the, in the research report. Does it become difficult if they become too large to be tested for your procedure or they will be anchored under the temperature? I think there, yeah, that, that's a concern, especially because there's, it's so hard to find an environmental chamber to fit these panels or five of them in a chamber and condition them. So obviously there is a size limitation there. But we, uh, we can talk with the structural engineers, design engineers, and we can maybe extrapolate in a conservative manner if there's a sign problem with the environmental chamber. This is just kind of a off topic, but it, has the code started to put anything in for blast resistance provisions and things like that for security applications? Is that something that was considered? Uh, I mean code saying international building code. has. It doesn't have any blast resistance at the moment. It doesn't have blast resistance, thermal. They are not in the building code at the moment. So we didn't address them. But if, um, if that's a trait that the manufacturer wants to be recognized, it can certainly be recognized in the research report. But code does not have requirements, so they become optional. Yes, there was another question. After. What was the ideal gap you found when they were placed between the back of the panel and the front of the water? Mm, I don't have inter information at the moment here. I'm not the producer, you know. Uh, we work on the acceptance criteria, but I think we should refer to the producer, panel producer. I understand you can actually create natural convection because of that gap. So on a very hot day, air starts moving up and it acts like a chimney and it lets it breathe and that sucks moisture off the building. Right, that's why we refer to code section 1403 for the radar envelope. So they have to comply with that section. I don't know the details about the gap or the installation. I, I have two questions. One, uh, just on the size uh, aspect. Like, uh, is, is there limitations on how much, what is the size of that panels uh, by using just um, you know, those uh, plastic fibers or poly? You know, or you have synthetic. to use some kind of a steel fibers. They are synthetic fibers. It's a proprietary material. It, there might be another mixture with steel fibers, that, but we worked on is about synthetic fibers. On the size of the fibers or size of the panels? Yeah. Which one are you asking? No, I mean, what size? Is there a limitation on the size? Size of the panel, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, the size of the panel, I need to uh, look at the criteria one more time. I didn't put all the information here. But it's the limiting factor is the test conditions right now. But if they are producing something more than what was tested, I guess we can you know, consult with the structural engineers and come up with a conservative approach or conservative analysis whether they can be acceptable. So you're saying that it has not been used on the, on the actual projects? This is just an evaluation right now? Is that what you're saying? They are used in actual projects. This is code compliance uh, project. So we are showing the code compliance. We are testing them to show that uh, they are conservative, safe per building codes. Okay, thank you.